Do saved people go to heaven when they die, or do they stay here on the earth? That's a attack on the rapture, the belief in a pre-tribulation pre rapture, that this ridiculous book right here, I'll show you here on camera, um, Rapture, Prophecy, or Heresy, H. Speed Wilson. Uh, we went through this thing here in the first part of the study, and now I'm going to go through the last part, last portion of this thing, and I'm going to show you the ridiculous attacks here. And uh, he offers a $10,000 reward to anybody that can prove that, you know, saints go to heaven when they die. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. And I don't expect to get a $10,000 reward because, quite honestly, this guy's very dishonest and uh, I don't trust him for anything. Let me zoom in here. Okay, we have chapter 12, the $10,000 challenge. The following scriptures state clearly requiring no interpretation that there will, there will be no rapture, the physical removal of biblical Christians from the world, earth to heaven. I will pay $10,000 to anyone or any group that who will list and quote, an equal number of scriptures that state as clearly there will be a rapture. Okay, so again, you see the deception right there. He puts rapture, you know, in there. The word rapture is not in the King James Bible, all right? But what's described, what the rapture stands for, what that word stands for is in the King James Bible. So again, you see he's already putting little things in there so he doesn't have to pay the $10,000. Why? Because the guy's a liar. Number one. Jesus prayed in John 17, 15, and 20, I pray not that you, see, he adds to the scriptures here big time, Father God should take them, believers, verse 20, out of the world, but keep them from evil. Do you doubt and that the prayers of Jesus Christ our Lord will be answered, fulfilled? So turn in your Bible to John. We're going to go to John chapter 17. We're going to get into context. Okay, we're going to see who the Lord's speaking to here, what's going on. John 17, we're going to start at verse 13. I wanted to take the time to do this video because I know some people actually have asked questions about this. You know, do you go to heaven when you die? Or is it some kind of a thing where you stay here on the earth? So we'll read here John 17, verse 13 through 21. It says, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have uh, my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, just look about this here. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Okay? Over here, he says, uh, um, where is it here? Uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 16, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Question, was Jesus Christ ever removed from the earth? Yeah, he was resurrected and went up. So Jesus, is, what he's saying in this passage is here, he's saying the things that are happening to me are going to happen to my believers. And I'm going to give them my word as their standard of truth. That's what's going on there. When you get saved, you don't go and get resurrected out. No. The Lord keeps you here on this earth. Why? For the ministry of reconciliation. He has a purpose in you being here. That's why you don't get resurrected out at first but you do eventually, which we're going to be seeing in this study. So to teach, to use this to somehow disprove the rapture, that doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. But back to the Speed Wilson book here. Number two, he says, Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, 29 through 40, I shall get first gather the tares from among the wheat. 
The field is the world, the wheat represents the children of the kingdom, the tares are the children of the devil, and the harvest is the end of this age. See, again, he, the guy claims that he's quoting the King James Bible, but he, doesn't, he isn't quoting the King James Bible. He's changing the text the whole way through the thing. The guy is just a total lost heretic. It's just disgusting. But, again, you see, this guy is non-dispensational. He'll go all over the Bible to try and disprove the rapture. You know, he's just all over the place. But let's look at the scripture there. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. We're going to start at verse 24. Matthew 13 and verse 24 through verse 30. It says here, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together the first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now what is going on there? What is this passage speaking of? This passage is talking about the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. Again, the book of Matthew is written to the Jewish people. All right? The church age was still a mystery throughout most of the time that that book was written. It is pointed doctrinally at Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what's going on there. And at the end there, in Matthew chapter 25, that is where you actually have the judgment of the nations. This event right here, the separating of the wheat and the tares. Now, you know, instruction in righteousness, yeah, it's there. You can kind of make some of those arguments. The saved are going to be going up. The lost are going to be staying down. But again, you have to be careful because it's saying the tares are gathered first and they're burned and things like that. So there's some instruction in righteousness, but doctrinally it is not pointed to us. All right? And it's, but it's interesting too because he'll try to say, see, that is the same thing as the rapture passages in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But you read there, it's saying the dead in Christ go up first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So you see, the catching away there of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there's no mention of anybody that's wicked being taken to judgment. Not any mention at all of that. Do not be deceived by this thing here. Now he says here in, in the, the third one, he says here, Jesus also explains in Matthew 13, 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend evil and them which do iniquity. Okay? So let's look about this. Matthew 13, verses 31 through 43. Okay, you can look there in your Bible. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Reference to the nation of Israel. Okay, It's a little tiny nation right now, but it's eventually going to be the greatest nation on the earth. Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of, of, excuse me, of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Again, this is talking about the judgment of the nations. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 25. Verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of, furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So, again, what you're seeing here has no, you know, there are some similarities in, as far as, like I said, instruction and righteousness. But doctrinally, this is not what's, this is not, what's going on here is not the same thing that happens with the church. All right? With the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a different group. All right? These are talking about saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. But, of course, this guy here, Speed Wilson, doesn't understand that because it's dispensational teaching. Okay, number four here, he says, Jesus continues to emphasize his point in Matthew 13, 47 through 48. Again, they cast the bad, evil, wicked away at the end of the age. He keeps changing the text here, too. It does not say end of the age. It says end of the world. So, this guy's just such a liar. But, um, look next at... Uh, these, some of these verses he's trying to quote here. Matthew 13, verses 47 through 51. Okay, it says here, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be in, at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, uh, saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Well, they understood, but Speed Wilson apparently does not. Okay? What is going on here? The wicked are being cast away, and the righteous are inheriting the kingdom. Could you please show me anywhere in the Pauline epistles where you have Wicked being sent into hell and righteous going and inheriting the kingdom. It's not there. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Both references, the dead in Christ go up first, then we which are alive and remain are caught up after that. That's not the same thing that's going on here in Matthew chapter 13. Not at all. I actually heard a guy the one time, John Weaver I think is what his name was, and he was actually trying to say, use these passages in Matthew and say it's the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And when it says about, you know, the dead are called up first, that's actually the dead being taken to judgment. And I wrote to the guy and I said, it says the dead in Christ. How can you make wicked people, lost people, dead in Christ? Okay? It doesn't make any sense. If you're in Christ, then you are saved. But we'll continue here. Number five in this book, Jesus states this point so very clearly in Matthew 13, 49, at the end of the age, the wicked shall be taken from among the just. Even after all these examples, Jesus asks us in verse 51, have you understood all these parables taken together? Amplified Bible there, he's quoting. Do we now, do we now understand who is taken destroyed out of the world at the end of the age? This guy's so warped. Okay. The wicked in Matthew chapter 25 are taken, cast into the lake of fire. The righteous, the sheep, you know, the wicked are the goats, the sheep are the righteous. They inherit the kingdom. Simple. It's not the rapture. Number six here. Jesus is not a false prophet. In Matthew 24 verses 37 through 41, Jesus prophesies saying, As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah before the flood... They, and then you can just read all this stuff here. I'm not going to go through all that. But that says there are two. Notice down here he says, Two men will be in the field, the wicked one will be taken, and the, the righteous one left. Two women grinding at the mill, the wicked one will be taken, and the righteous one left. Again, he's showing his ignorance of Scripture here. We're going to see about this. Okay? Matthew chapter 24. Turn there in your Bible. Matthew chapter 24. You know, a lot of people. 
you know, I just want to say this too before we continue. A lot of people say, well, Brian, why are you always debunking these people and stuff? Why are you always debunking? Why don't you just teach the Bible? I am teaching the Bible. See, part of your learning as a Christian is you need to know how to get into sword fights with people. You need to know how to defend your position. And if you're not learning those things, it's going to mean problems for you. That's what I'm trying to teach you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 through 41, it says here, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And see, he's saying the ones that are taken are the wicked, being taken to judgment. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. Okay, you say, how do you know that? Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verse 34. Luke 17, verse 34 through 37. It says here, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other left. Other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, Speed Wilson, in this book, he said that the ones that are taken are the wicked. But look at verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Whence or where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now I believe in the context of that, those that are taken are actually taken out in the mountains there. They flee from Jerusalem. They get away from that. They don't stay there. They're not left there. They're taken out there and they actually are there and the Lord comes down and wipes out that army that's coming out to destroy them. So, again, Speed Wilson doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? Now, I'm not going to read this whole next one because it's just a lot more ridiculous stuff. But you can read it there if you want to pause it. He's just talking about in Luke 17, 26 through 30. He's trying to deal with these verses I just showed you. He's saying, you know, about the wicked, you know, and all this stuff and, and how that, uh, you know, wheresoever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. See, again, he's, you know, quoting just any version he wants to, just putting things into the text, whatever. Guy's a total heretic. But uh, it says here, where an angel calls the fowls that fly to devour the dead who rebelled against God. Okay. And again, how's this disproving the pre-trib rapture? It's rather ridiculous. Number eight. Peter confirms this truth for us in 2 Peter 2, 5. God saved uh, Noah, bringing the flood upon the ungodly of the world. Noah was not taken out of the world. Okay, so let's go there. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 in your King James Bible. Verse 4. It says here, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, uh, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their law, with their unlawful deeds. Uh, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. All right. Now, think about that. You have two different examples given there in that passage. All right. In terms of men there. You have know, the angels that sinned up there in verse 4, but then it goes into Noah and it goes into Lot. All right? Now look what it says in verse 9 there. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the, the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. How did God deliver Noah? Noah 
was saved from the flood, but he went through it. What about Lot? Lot was saved from burning in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because he was taken out before God's judgment came. You see? Two different people there. Two different uh, systems, if you will. What you have there, Noah is like a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble saint, whereas Lot is a picture of a Christian. Excuse me. Lot is a picture of a Christian. So you have these two different types there. Noah picturing the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble saint. Excuse me. Lot picturing a Christian. It's not the same thing. Okay? So again, this does not prove anything. This, this saying, you know, well, Noah went through the flood, therefore, you know, people are going to have, well, yes, a tribulate or a, keep wanting to say that, a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble will go through that horrible time just like Noah had to go through the flood. But God will spare him through that. This does not disprove things for Christians. But continuing here, here we have number nine. It says here, Jesus emphasizes his point that the righteous ones are not taken out of the world in Matthew 24, oh brother, 21 and 22, and Luke 13, 19 through 20, saying, in, If the days of the great tribulation were not shortened, no man would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days uh, will be shortened. Okay? Now let's just, I want to show you something that's interesting here. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, and I've talked about this thing so many times it just gets kind of like crazy anymore that nobody understands this. Um, Matthew chapter 24 is written to Jews, ladies and gentlemen. You say, how do you know? Let's read here. Verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, if he read it, he didn't understand it. All right? What's the holy place? All right? The holy place is the rebuilt temple where the Antichrist is going to set himself up to be worshipped. But look at the, ver the, the next verse here, verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. What are Christians doing in Judea? And if that's not enough, jump down to verse 20. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Do Christians have to keep the Sabbath day right now? No. Will a Jew have to keep the Sabbath day in the time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah, they will. Absolutely. You know, how can you miss this stuff? I mean, and it says here, verse 21 and 22, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Who's the elect in the passage? It's not New Testament Christians. Okay, It's not born-again believers in the body of Christ. It's talking about Jewish, saved Jewish people, the elect of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. You can look that up. But... Uh, he says here, Luke 13, 19 through 20. So let's go to Luke 13. So it's saying the same thing there in, as there in Matthew chapter 24. Luke 13. I'll show you here again just so you see he's saying it. Okay. Luke 13, 19 through 20. All right. Let's look at Luke 13, 19 through 20. It says here, It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? Huh? Um, how do you figure that that's saying the same thing as over there in Matthew chapter 24, verses uh, 21 through 22? It's not even close to being the same thing. Again, this Speed Wilson guy just shows a very high degree of ignorance. But let's continue here. Page 153 says, Jesus makes it so very clear that 
Biblical Christians will go through the Great Tribulation since the Bible makes it clear that all the wicked will be destroyed. God wouldn't need to shorten the days of tribulation if only the wicked are there. <sighs> Again, you can't have anybody but Christians around when it's the word saint is used. Um, no, there are saints. Saint is a generic term that refers to anybody that's saved in the Bible. Okay, They're all saints. I mean... These arguments are so very, very weak. It's just incredible. But uh, look at number 10 here, his objection or whatever. The 23rd Psalm repeats this message clearly. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Uh, so you just go back to the book of Psalms there and you say, I'm just going to rip this thing out. I'm going to say this is for us today. This disproves the pre-trib rapture. Absolutely ridiculous. Doesn't work that way. Uh, next we're going to go to um, number 11 here. He says, Psalm 37, 9 through 11, and verses 28 and 29, the evildoers. And, you know, it just, I don't even like to read this because he's adding words. He's putting his own words in there. Okay, and he goes down here, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell there forever. So let's actually go to Psalm 37. Go to Psalm 37. Oh. I apologize. I'm a little, I have a headache right now and I'm a little tired, so I'm kind of half out of it here. Uh, just bear with me, please. Psalm 37, verse 9 through 11 says, For evildoers, Evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. It's talking about a Jew that makes it through the time of Jacob's trouble, and inherits the earth in the time of the uh, millennial kingdom. That's what's going on here. Again, this has nothing to do with a Christian and to the exclusion of the Jews. We are born in with a spirit of adoption. We are fellow heirs. Yeah, that's true. But we don't somehow replace the nation of Israel and we get all the land and all the goodies and things and the Jews are just kind of pushed to the side. That's satanic heresy. Just incredible. But uh, let's look at verse 28 and 29 there in Psalm 37. It says here, For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Again, for the Jews. You can't take this stuff and make it for a Christian. All right. Um, number 12 here. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Okay. Um, again, you know, I mean, how does this disprove a pre-trib rapture? You know, God's going to destroy the wicked and he'll preserve the, the righteous and give them the land. Speaking of the Jewish people. Yes, that's true. Number 13. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but shall stay forever. All right, let's go to Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. Now, it's kind of interesting here. He just kind of uh, conveniently leaves some things out. Psalm 125, verses 1. 1 and 2, it says here, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about His people from henceforth, even forever. Um, Speed Wilson here apparently doesn't understand the Abrahamic covenant all right, that God established with Abraham and his seed forever. Pretty sad. Uh, Proverbs, which is this one, number 14 here, Proverbs 10, verse 30, 
The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. All right, let's go to Proverbs 10, verse 30. I don't want to read it and trust it from this guy's book. because You never know when he's going to change things. Proverbs 10, verse 30 says, The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. All right. You say, well then, see, that disproves the pre-trib rapture. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Okay? Removed in that passage simply means that you will not back down. You won't be removed. Okay, that's what it's talking about. And there is never going to be a time when there will never be any righteous people on the earth. Right? There's always going to be somebody who's righteous. I mean, think about that. The righteous shall never be removed. What happens when you die? you never be removed you just you know stay here on the earth and nothing ever happens to you well that's what speed wilson believes but i want to show you from the bible that that's not true but let's continue on here looking at his his points that he brings up which aren't really points <laughs> number 15 proverbs 2 21 and 22 for the upright shall dwell in the land the perfect shall remain in it but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it Okay, again, we're not even going to go there because it's just a waste of time. He keeps going over this thing. The, the wicked are taken to judgment. The righteous inhabit the earth. Yes, at the judgment of the nations, Matthew chapter 25, that's what's going on here. It's so ridiculous. This guy just does not know the Bible. All right. Um, number 16. All the above scriptures are combined and amplified in Psalm 37, 34 through 40. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. And when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Uh, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. And he passed away, and he goes down through a whole bunch of things here, saying about the be cut off and whatever else. To understand what 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 really tells us. Read chapter 5. Okay, that's the next one there. But, you know, he's talking about um, here in Psalm 37. We'll go there. Go to th Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verses 34 through 40. It says here, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Now what's going on there? Well, I'm sorry, I, let me continue reading a couple verses here. Verse 37 through 40. It says here, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. Again, he keeps using these scriptures that talk about wicked people being taken to judgment and the righteous being spared. And he says, see, that right there proves that there's no rapture. No, it proves that at the judgment of the nations, the Jewish people are going to be separated. Okay, along with anybody else who's left at that time, which probably won't be that many people. But the fact is, the sheep go to the right hand, the goats to the left hand. The sheep go into the kingdom, the goats go down to hell. That's what's going on there. This has nothing to do with the rapture of the body of Christ. It's just a desperate piece of lying and propaganda. Finally here he says, uh, to understand what 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 really tells us, read chapter 5. And he's talking there. Uh, I don't even know what version that is. Some new perversion. you know. And he says about amen and amen. You know, and, and again, he's trying to say that you can be finished there by receiving more gifts of the Holy Ghost and whatever else. Just absolute nonsense. But uh, here it is. There's his address. 
And it says here, P.S. Rep reproduction and distribution of this $10,000 challenge is approved and encouraged. In the interest of prom promoting gospel truth, Daring Books will consider publishing any book which answers point by point, chapter by chapter, irrefutable scripture, proving and supporting a rapture doctrine without changing or distorting or ignoring each of the scriptures clearly stated in Colonel Wilson's book. So it's okay for Colonel Wilson to change and distort scriptures, but when you try to answer him back, you know, you're not allowed to change or distort the scriptures. This book is in my collection, probably a top 10 collection of the most ridiculous things I've ever read. Absolute garbage. Not even worth his, you know, toilet paper. But I'm actually going to show you now some scriptures that prove that saved people go to heaven after death. All right. First, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. You know, I mean, Speed Wilson, oh, there's no really clear scriptures proving that, that people go to heaven when they die. Second Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that morta mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, that whilst we are always, therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's a house in heaven prepared for us. It's right there. And it says there that I, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Is the Lord on the earth or in heaven? You say, well, the Lord's in heaven. Okay, then, when you die, you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. If I drop dead right here on camera, boom, and I go down... You're just looking at my body. I'm not in there anymore. My soul and my spirit have departed, gone to be with the Lord. Now my body will catch up, you know, at the at the rapture. Okay, this corruptible will put on incorruption, you know. But to teach this thing that there's no scripture to prove that people go to heaven when they die, I'm sorry, that's showing quite a high degree of ignorance of scripture. Next, we'll go to John 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. Thomas Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? How's the way that you get to eternal life there? How do you get, how do you get to heaven? Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Where's the Father at? On earth? You say, no, the Father's in heaven. Okay. How do you go? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Me. Nobody goes to heaven when they die? Uh, no, you go to heaven when you die. You, that's where the Father is. That's why Jesus goes there and he's preparing mansions and he comes back to get us and takes, him, take us, takes us up there. Next we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1.
First Peter chapter one, verse one. One through four. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath, obtain, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Now look at this. Reserved in heaven, heaven for you. Why is there a reward in heaven, an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away? Why is it reserved in heaven if you don't go there when you die? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 34. It says here, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. What's it doing in heaven if you don't go up there? Hmm? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 1 through 5. Okay, it says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to, the, to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the, of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Again, you see this thing of rewards being laid up in heaven. You know? I mean, how can you miss this stuff? Just incredible to me. Second Corinthians chapter 12 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. It says, It is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into heaven into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Okay? Paul was caught up Paul, excuse me. Paul was caught up to third heaven and he called it paradise. Hmm. Does anything else appear in the Bible like that? Yeah. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 42 through 43. It says here, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember, we, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know, up there. Heaven. Oh, but nobody ever goes to heaven when they die. According to... Uh, Speed Wilson over here. Can you give me some clear scriptures? Okay, we'll continue and I'll continue giving you clear scriptures. It's right there. Now let's go to Luke 18. While we're here in the book of Luke, Luke 18, verse 18 through 22. Twenty-two. 
It says here, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Now look at this. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. What good is treasure going to do you in heaven if you never go there? If you just stay here on earth. What good is your treasure doing you up there? Doesn't even make sense. Go to Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, verse 22 and 23. It says here, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great on the earth. Now, actually, it says uh, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Again, you have rewards in heaven, not down here on the earth. What are your rewards doing being sent up to a place where you're never going to go? This doesn't make any sense. Turn next to Ephesians chapter 2. Speed Wilson said, give me just a few clear scriptures on the thing of people going to heaven when they die. That's what we're doing. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Now look at this next verse hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you know that you have a special connection right now to heaven, even while you're here on this earth? You're actually seated together in heavenly places. You have a spiritual connection. It's like you're already in heaven. That's why you get convicted about things that you're doing wrong. That's why the Lord will speak through your mouth. That's why the Lord will do things in your life. Why? You're seated together with him in heaven right now. You're as good as being there. It's really something. Turn next to Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to go here to the book of Revelation. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures here and then we'll be done proving this thing of, you know, people say, you know, that, uh, there's really no scripture that proves that Christians go to heaven when you die or something like this. That is so ridiculous. I've actually had people tell me that. But let's continue here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It says here, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Wait a second. Where's God's throne at? Heaven, right? Where's Jesus' throne at? Heaven. Well, if we're going to sit with him in his throne, if we overcome there, the Laodicean church period, if you will, if we're going to sit with him in his throne, where would we have to go? You say, oh, on the earth. No, um, up to heaven. I know that's really difficult to figure out, you know, but uh, try, you know. Uh, look at chapter 4 here, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay, and then it goes on in the rest of the thing there to describe what he sees, the rest of the things that he sees. But you see there again, John is called up to heaven. So how can you say nobody ever goes to heaven when they die? Pretty incredible. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. 
It says here, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Well, obviously, you know, uh, wouldn't be any man out up there because there aren't any men in heaven, right? Well, let's look at verse 3. Revelation 5, 3. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Why are there men in heaven if nobody goes to heaven when they die? It's a problem for Speed Wilson. Big problem. Okay, look at verse 8 through 12. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, uh, verse 11 and 12 here. And I beheld it, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne of the, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb which or that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Okay? Again, you have twenty-four elders up there in heaven, and you also have this great multitude. Who was the great multitude there? This, these angels. Well, I believe that they are Christians, New Testament Christians. The Bible says in the resurrection they are as the angels of God. Okay, Old Testament you have the sons of God being angels. New Testament you have now are ye the sons of God. We have replaced those sons of God that, that basically have you know rebelled along with Lucifer. They left their first estate. All right, now we'll go to Revelation chapter 7. Just a few more places to turn to here, and we'll be done. Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 through 17. And again, we're going to see this thing of, you know, Speed Wilson said there's no mention of anybody ever going to heaven when they die. Let's look about that. Revelation 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Uh, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Uh, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the, of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them. Uh, unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Again, you have men in heaven serving God before His throne. How can you teach that no one goes to heaven when they die? Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. Revelation 15, verse 2, it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Again, it's a scene from heaven. There are men there. These are saints from the time of Jacob's trouble. How can you miss this stuff? Revelation chapter 19 Revelation 19. This will be where we're going to end it here. Verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. <clears throat> and again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his saints, servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. 
Um, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the, as the voice of many waters and the, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Um, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of, his, of the Lamb is come, and his, and, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, uh, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? Again, you see the saints are in heaven. Okay? The marriage of the Lamb, the bride of Christ is in heaven before the second coming. Before mm -hmm. Jesus Christ comes down in verses 11 through the end of the chapter there, before Jesus Christ comes back down, you see the bride of Christ in heaven. I mean, how can you miss this stuff? Just incredible. And, of course, you know, there are a lot more scriptures we could go over here, but, you know, I think I proved the point. Um, there are plenty of scriptures that show that Christians do go to heaven when they die. This thing, this teaching that you get to just stay down here on the earth and, and whatever else, that's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? That's what heretics like this book here. That's what they teach. So, am I expecting to ever see $10,000 from Speed Wilson because I just proved him wrong? No. Because he'll just run away to his new versions or the Greek, you know. He'll just run away to that stuff there. He's a liar, like so many of these other people. Um, just incredible. And of course, they're going to try harder and harder and harder to take away your faith in the very soon imminent rapture. Um, we are getting close. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, I have another video i got to do yet, so I'm going to have to end this one here. And um, I really do apologize for being just half out of it today. I'm just, uh, I haven't been getting much sleep at night and uh, just been real busy with a bunch of things and, and I'm just it's kind of catching up to me right now and I uh, just need to get these sermons done need to get them edited rendered uploaded and you know just kind of uh, slow down a little bit or something here it's just it's starting to really catch up to me so let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll end the video dear Heavenly Father I thank you Lord for the authority of your word I thank you that you have made promises to us, Lord, that are in writing, that we know that we will one day escape this wicked planet and we will go and be with you in heaven. And I thank you, Lord, for that tremendous promise. And I just pray, Lord, that you would please um, help all of your believers out there, Lord, to def defend off these attacks that are constantly being hurled at us, these fiery darts of the wicked that are... Uh, constantly trying to get us off course and get us off track I just pray Lord that you would please protect each of your saints out there and that you would help us all to stay in your word and uh, I just ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen alright that's going to be it like I said I have another video or two to do here and I'm going to try to get those done and then I think I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I'm very tired. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.